All right, guys, thank you for coming. Welcome to the final Canals Brown Bag with the 2019 class. It's been an excellent year, and I'm very excited to cap it off with a presentation from Amanda Carter, a Canals Fellow working as a Congressional Affairs Fellow for NOAA Research. Amanda has a master's and a PhD from Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. Her graduate research focused on global and local stressors on coral reefs and their impacts on the spatial, chemical, and microbial ecology of the benthic community. She was fortunate enough to spend the last eight years working on the Palmyra Atoll, one of her favorite places to dive. And today she'll be presenting invasion and restoration at Palmyra Atoll, benthic dynamics associated with the invasive coral morph Rhodactus halicae. Thank you, Amanda. Yay, good job. Um, wait, do I have to hold this too? Oh, okay, good. I was like, I'm gonna lose my mind if I have to hold everything. Um, okay, hi guys, thanks for coming. Last one of the year. Um, so I am here to talk to you guys today um, about a little bit of the research that I did for my PhD and then also touching on a restoration experiment that um, my advisor and I came up with way back in 2012 when I was her master's student and that we started at the Atoll and it's actually a continuing experiment to this day. Um, please feel free to ask me questions during the talk. I hate having someone talk at me for a really long time. Um, so feel free to ask questions um, or clarification for anything. And with that, we will get started. So unless you've been there we go. Um, living under a rock, you've probably seen some headlines, um, particularly in the last two years, about. Does this not like me? Do I need a? Okay. Um, about things like the death of the Great Barrier Reef. Like there's actually an obituary notice for it, or maybe you got to watch the um, documentary Chasing Coral, and you got to see images like this one showing these beautiful coral colonies that bleached and then were overgrown by algae. Um, and I think that currently in the press, we're hearing a lot of doom and gloom when it comes to reefs. Um, you're hearing about them dying, you're hearing about overfishing, you're hearing about bleaching events, warming waters, and all of these things. Um, and in fact, actually, I um, defended my PhD in December of 2018, and that was just after my clicker doesn't like me. There we go. <laughs> um, that was just after the fourth national climate assessment came out. And I think it's kind of uh, full circle that I'm here now today and talking about this because one of the things that was in that national climate assessment that was released the day after Thanksgiving was that ecosystems and the benefits they provide to society are being altered by climate change and these impacts are projected to continue. Without substantial and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions, transformative impacts on some ecosystems will occur. Some coral reef and sea ice ecosystems are already experiencing such transformational changes. So we've been hearing a lot about this sort of um, doom and gloom side of things. But it's also really important to hear about areas that are hope spots or areas where we're seeing these impacts happen and then we're seeing a reef's ability to recover um, from these different changes. So to set the stage for things, I have a question for you guys. What do you think, and if you're a coral scientist, you don't get to answer this question, but what do you think the most limiting resource on a coral reef is? What drives competition on a coral reef? Come on, guys. So space. Space. space, exactly. So one of the most limiting factors on a coral reef is actually competition for space. And this means that space ends up resulting in areas to grow, getting to sunlight, all of these things that corals need, right? And so when you're on a reef, you can actually see competition for space happening at between different organisms, between different corals. Um, where I worked, you actually got to see a ton of coral coral competition. You see uh, competition with things like turf algae, with some invasive species, and then with other calcifiers on the reef like crustose coral and algae, which is this pink kind of pavement, bubblegum looking stuff um, that I'll be talking about a little bit more as well. So one of the things that can happen with this competition is on a healthy or intact reef, these competitive dynamics are in a balance that actually favor corals or calcifiers. And so this is a photo from one of my favorite sites that I took at Palmyra. Um, I'll actually be talking about what this person is doing in the background in a little bit. But you can see that you have lots of this CCA, this pink bubblegum calcifier that actually helps cement coral rubble together. And some of those different species provide chemical cues that um, coral larvae land on. Um, and then a lot of hard coral, and you don't see as much of that turf 
um, or macroalgae growing on that reef. And you'll also notice that there's a lot of ergosity to this reef as well. But when you have stressors that come in, occurring at a variety of scales, and these can also be natural stressors or human-induced, you can actually shift that dynamic so that instead of the calcifiers winning, you can have these more fleshy organisms winning. And a few different examples of these on the global and natural scale are things like storms. Hurricanes can come through and wipe out corals, and then you have this change in those competitive dynamics. You can also have things like crown of thorns, cots, come through and take out some corals. You can have disease like we've been hearing about in Florida. Um, you can have human-induced global changes, things like ocean acidification and global warming. And then you can have local point source pollution that changes those um, competitive interactions as well. Things like pollution coming off, um, overfishing and remover, removal of herbivores from the reef. These herbivores are really important because they serve to help graze down all of that algae and provide space for the corals to grow. So these different disturbances can end up resulting in a shift in those competitive interactions, and that can actually lead to a long-term what's called a phase shift, where you can go from this hard coral-dominated reef to one that's dominated by macroalgae or fleshy algae. And these phase shifts are one of the things that we hear about um, a lot in the media. And these really long-term changes um, are things that are frequently studied. So you see these long-term shifts towards fleshy or macroalgae um, and this change where this coral community is no longer able to recover and regain its hold or regain its ability to win in those competitive interactions. And one of the things that can often lead to these really long-term changes and shifts are different compounding impacts on the reef. So if you have point source pollution, you have overfishing of the reef, the reef is already really stressed out, and then you have something come through like a warming event um, or a hurricane or whatever it may be, that competitive interaction can shift over to those algae and then the reef can have a really hard time recovering. However, we frequently look at these disturbances, um, and this is from a study out at the Great, on the Great Barrier Reef, and I apologize, these photos, the quality got a little messed up, uploading them to Google Drive. But so this is this beautiful, healthy reef um, in 2006, and they went back in 2010, and there was this huge, what was like a community shift or a phase shift. So this was pretty macroalgae dominated. You can see all these large corals that provided all that rugosity on the reef are gone. Um, and frequently, this is where people sometimes stop looking at these reefs. And then when they went back in 2012, there's still a lot of algae in this photo, but you can see that there's a number of these kind of smaller corals coming back into the community. And then by 2014, that reef actually looks pretty similar to what it did in 2006. The corals aren't quite as big, but this was in an area that was relatively protected. There weren't a lot of those other confounding um, impacts, and you're actually able to see the reef recover from this disturbance event throughout time. So, to do this and to look at a similar event, um, I used Palmyra Atoll as a case study. Palmyra is about a thousand miles south of Hawaii. It's one of the northernmost islands of the Line Island chain. Um, and it's a national wildlife refuge and it's part of the Pacific Remote Island Marine National Monument. So Palmyra is extremely protected. Um, it has been for a while. It's also uh, an uninhabited island and it's never had a human population, which means that the impacts to the reef are pretty minimal. Um, but if you are fortunate enough to work at an institution that goes out there, um, NOAA goes out there, actually I analyzed a lot of the photo quads from Palmyra way before when I was actually just a volunteer in my lab uh, and was very excited to get to go there as an actual student. You can go out to this little atoll, there's very few of us on the island at a time, um, you get to know your lab mates and coworkers very well, for better or for worse. And the reefs there tend to be beautiful. Um, you have a lot of hard coral cover, you have high calcifiers. Um, Palmyra has a really, really healthy and intact top predator population. So there's tons of sharks, lots of reef fish, and it's in general a pretty intact community. And just to give you an idea of what the atoll looks like, this black is land, and then this gray, uh, the white is mostly these are lagoons, so we have a western center and eastern lagoon 
And one of the things about Paul Meyer that's a little bit unique, and you'll be hearing me refer to these names, so I just wanted to orient you guys to this, is that it has what we call a reef terrace. So it's a portion of the reef that's actually really expansive at Paul Meyer that's inside of the reef crest that's about five to 10 meters in depth, and that has really high coral cover. And then these FR sites here out along the edge are those classic four reef sites. And this site over here that I'll be talking about, PSM, Penguin Spit Middle, is a back reef site. Um, and then I'll be talking about the long liner site a lot as well. And so this is just to orient you guys to all this. And this is one of my favorite sites at Palmyra, RT10, just to give you an idea of what that coral cover looks like. Um, tons of huge acropora, branching, plating, healthy fish. Um, it's a really beautiful and unique ecosystem to get to study and a beautiful place to get to dive. But despite how protected Palmyra is, it is not completely free from human impacts. So in 1991, some gentlemen stole a long lining vessel um, and thought that if they grounded it on a US territory, they would actually be able to get US citizenship. So this was about a 110 foot long, line, long lining vessel that they grounded on the reef terrace at Palmyra. Um, they did not get US citizenship. Uh, and it was left to kind of break up and degrade on the reef. Um, and when I went to Palmyra for the first time, it was still there. But in 2008, Terry Work at USGS um, and Greta Abbey published a paper documenting the spread of this invasive coralomorph around that shipwreck. Um, and this is from their paper in 2008. You can see this red epicenter of where the long liner is, and then these radiating toad diver surveys that showed the extent to which it was moving out from that shipwreck. Um, at the atoll. And the coralomorph is interesting because although these guys are actually native to the Indo-Pacific, this one is able to grow over coral and in certain situations you can actually see it causes tissue necrosis or death of the coral tissue as it grows over it. Um, and at this site we saw this ability for that coralomorph to come in and just wipe out all of that hard coral cover. And the area around this site was actually close to 100% coral morph cover in a lot of those areas. Um, and this always brings me, <laughs> I think I've had this slide in every single talk I've given during my entire graduate career, because everyone has to ask, like, what is the coral? Does anyone here know what a coral morph is? Has anyone heard of it before? Yeah, but that's the kids here, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> um, so coral morphs are actually cnidarian. So they're related to corals. They're an anthozoan, um, but they're in coral morph area. They, also demonstrate this competitive advantage over corals in disturbed environments. And these have been seen before, um, or this sort of overgrowth of them has been seen in areas like in the Red Sea, in really shallow reef flats. Um, and this, are you guys admiring the beautiful? Yeah, so my, one of my friends is an amazing scientific illustrator and she drew me lots of fantastic uh, coral morph images that you'll see. Um, and so they have this ability to grow over these corals and at Palmyra, we are seeing this really long-term community shift. Um, this, you know, that wreck occurred in 1991, and in 2012 and 13, the area around that shipwreck was up to 100% in a lot of those areas. Um, so that's an example, just to touch on this, of a local stressor. This is actually what I'll be focusing on today. Uh, another part of my PhD was looking at the response of a relatively intact reef to a global stressor. Um, I happened to be out at Palmyra for all of the years of the last major bleaching event um, and was able to do a lot of work looking at the response of the reef to it there. If you guys are interested in reading a little bit more about this, I have a paper coming out and then also my, uh, co uh, my coworker and I published a paper with our lab looking at the response of the reef to it as well. So my overall research kind of touched on four different areas that made it into my actual dissertation. Um, first, chapter one was looking at the spatial and temporal dynamics of Rhodactis hawasi, that invasive crown morph around Palmyra. Chapter two was looking at what competitive mechanisms might be involved in the spread of Rhodactis hawasi, so what allows it to grow over those corals and actually kill them <coughs> as it grows over them. Then I investigated whether or not we saw any species-specific responses in coral microbial communities to the invasion. Um, were there any coral species that were more resistant to invasion? Did that have anything to do with their coral microbial communities? And then how did those communities respond to and recover from the bleaching event as well? But for today, because you don't want to listen to that for this long, I'm only going to focus on chapter one. Um, but I like to think of this as going from really big, thinking about the spatial ecology, 
to smaller on a coral scale where you're thinking about the chemical ecology of this invasion to really, really small, which is the microbial ecology of invasion and bleaching. Um, and those correspond to my four chapters, but we're just going to focus on this larger scale one for today. There we go. So chapter one, uh, the paper associated with this chapter is this one published in Coral Reefs, Changes in Benthic Community Composition Associated with the Outbreak of the Kralmorphodactus Hausai at Palmyra Atoll. Does anyone have any questions so far? That was a lot of information I just viewed. <laughs> so in this chapter, we kind of address four main questions. Um, where have we observed Redactus Hausai around Palmyra? How are benthic communities changing around the atoll? How are benthic communities changing at the shipwreck site itself? And then are certain substrate more easily invaded than others? Um, this was a massive data set that spanned over 10 years um, and used multiple different uh, types of data. We had data from toad diver surveys around the island. Um, a lot of these were conducted, or some of these were conducted by NOAA. Others were conducted by our lab and others. We have these things that my lab works on called photo mosaics. And I'll just touch on what these are really quick, although I'm not going to be showing a lot of data from this. Um, when I showed that picture earlier and I said I'd talk about what the person in the background was doing, we call this our pet name for this thing is the photo megatron. Um, and this is two really high quality cameras that one's taking video, one is taking photos, and it's flown over the reef in kind of a lawnmower pattern doing these really light wide swaths by a diver and then goes back and then that goes back with us to the lab. Um, and a member of our lab vid created this really amazing software to stitch it all together. And you get these, this is a hundred meter squared one. We have ones larger than this as well. And you can see the reef at hundred meters squared and you can actually zoom into a resolution of about a centimeter on these. So you can do these every year. You can do them multiple times a year and you can actually come back and look at large scale and really small scale changes in that coral community. And then the other part of this data set was sort of the more classic benthic ecologist method of taking photo quadrats. So this is me taking a picture. Um, this is at RT10, the one I showed you guys that video of. Uh, when my advisor installed this photo quadrat in 2009, um, she put this on relatively flat reef. And this Acropora has grown up so far that you actually have to have one diver dive down to find the pin where it's embedded about four feet lower in this Acropora. And then the person up here has the photo from the previous year trying to line it up so that we get that replication throughout time. But something important to touch on here is that we also, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service gave about, I think it was about $6 million to remove the longliner wreck. Um, and research I'm not talking about here, but that I did for my master's um, helped pave the way for some of this. And it was a really awesome thing to get to be a part of. So in the winter of 2013, Fish and Wildlife went in with this massive commercial diving operation and they were actually able to cut up the shipwreck, the Hui Fang, which was the name of that ship. And they were able to remove the shipwreck from the area. And they did this in the hopes that it would help change those dynamics on the reef and help facilitate recovery of the reef after the shipwreck was removed. And so before that happened, earlier in 2013, I went out to Palmyra and I set up um, a series of four transects. One was actually in place for my advisor before in the four cardinal directions so that we could actually track the change in that community and look at the recovery of the reef throughout time around that shipwreck removal site. So here I am installing a <laughs> um, photo quadrat on an area that's 100% coralomorph, which is what most of those areas looked like at that time. And so this is just to give you guys an idea of what a photo quadrat looks like and the sort of things that we're doing. So the benthic community at Palmyra and what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about today in the data is gonna focus primarily on hard coral, coral morph, that invasive species, macroalgae, mixed turf, and then crestose coralline algae, which is that pink pavement or pink bubble gum that helps cement the reef together. Um, and this is an example of what a photo quad looks like once you've brought it back to the lab. And so after taking these photos, you put them into this software called PhotoGrid. And when I started volunteering in this lab in 2008 or nine, uh, as an undergrad, this is what I got to sit and do. So I would 
most photos are a lot prettier than this, um, but I would upload these photos. The software lays 100 stratified random points across the photo, and then you go through and you click down to the finest taxonomic resolution possible what it is underneath the point in that photo. Um, this is actually a really easy one because it's almost all corral morph. This is from one of my um, sites at Palmyra, but it actually provides you with a lot of data relatively easily that you can collect from year to year to look at changes in that benthic community. So this is the compilation of all of those different types of data sets that we had, but primarily focusing on presence or absence of the corral morph at the time that data set was collected, just to get this really broad, large scale view of where we'd seen Redactus Hausai around the atoll. And if you think back to earlier, I had that slide from Terry Work's paper in 2008 that showed the little blip of Coralomorph at that long liner site and radiating out from it. And this is what that site looked like as of 2018. And you can see here areas that are white are some of our sites that had no Coralomorph, but you can see that the Coralomorph has really spread out along the reef terrace and has moved along a lot of the fore reef as well. Although these far western and far eastern tips of the reef um, did not have it present. However, these sites are pretty difficult to get to. Palmyra is very exposed um, and you can have, even in relatively nice weather, it can be pretty difficult to get out to those sites. So you can see how much it's been moving around the atoll and the fact that at these sites that I'm gonna talk about today, we had corral morph at all of them um, as of 2018. So if we're thinking about how the benthic community has changed in response to the corral morph all around the atoll from 2009 to 2017, you can see this graph here showing uh, data collected from those photo quadrats that were taken every year. Um, my old lab went to Palmyra generally one to two times a year, sometimes more, and took all of this data, analyzed it, and so we have a pretty robust and very long-term data set. And so you can see that some of these sites here, those four reef sites, FR3 and 5, RT10, which is that beautiful terrace site I showed you guys the video of, and Penguin Spit Middle, which was that back reef site, um, just south of where the longliner wreck was and across the channel. Some of those sites didn't have corral morph in 2009, or if they did, they had like one single polyp. And then you can see that by 2013 and 2015, most of those sites had very high levels of corral morph in some instances, 40% um, of those photo quadrats is a lot. Um, but then you also see there's some like varying dynamics in here. So sites like FR3, you actually see a little bit of a decrease in that corral morph throughout time. And to make that a little bit easier to see, this is the change, so final minus initial cover of those various benthic groups throughout time. So you can see that as the corral morph is increasing, a lot of those sites where you see that increase in corral morph you see this decrease in hard coral cover. So this sort of answered our question of what the coral morph is doing around the atoll. We were seeing a general increase at it in a lot of areas. Um, and just to give you guys an idea of what that looked like in those photo quadrats, this is FR5, one of those areas that in 2009 had one single polyp of coral morph, which we actually didn't even see in the photo when it was analyzed that year. Um, a point didn't land on it, and it was so small and so far down in a crack that it wasn't even noticed. By 2011, you had a pretty small patch of the coralomorph that was growing up. By 2014, this is all coralomorph here in this plot, and by 2016, you can see that this plot looks completely different. Um, the coral, a lot of these large coral heads that were in here have been completely overgrown by coralomorph, um, and a lot of those are actually dead. But when you go and you look at the shipwreck site, remember that shipwreck was removed in 2013. So this data set starts just before the shipwreck removal. The shipwreck, oh, the little line didn't show up in this for some reason. The shipwreck removal happened here. You see a very, very, very different story. So we actually saw this amazing decrease in the corral morph cover at the shipwreck site after that removal. We saw an increase in CCA and a slight increase in hard coral cover. Um, the hard coral cover wasn't quite as noticeable, but when you look at the corral morph decrease, I mean, it went from an average of around 75% all around that site to down to close to zero by 2017. Um, and it's actually even lower now. So this was really exciting to see. It suggested that the removal of the shipwreck and perhaps something associated 
with the disturbance actually of removing that wreck might have helped cause yet another community shift or another um, change in that environment that was helping facilitate the decrease of the crowd mark. Um, and I feel like the image quality on these isn't great from up here, but this is one of these photo quadrats in 2013. There's nothing in that photo but Kralmar. And as you move down this, you can see this beginning of this breakup. By 2015, you have polyps in there of the Kralmar that have a lot of space in between them. And by 2016, there's hardly any Kralmar polyps left. And you can see that pink CCA, that pavement that helps glue things together, is coming in. And um, that CCA recovery is actually really important for this part of the reef because there's a paper um, that looks at this, but that cover of Kralomorph actually changed the reef there from a net accretion, so actually calcifying and creating more reef to net dissolution. So when we looked underneath these areas of Kralomorph, what had once been pretty like hard Ragos reef was actually starting to dissolve and crumble. So when I showed that picture of me installing a photo quadrat in 2013, um, you would go to put a pin in somewhere that looked like it was hard reef and like you'd have to hammer a pin in and you would go to hammer it and then the reef would just like explode into calcium carbonate dust, um, which made installing those photo quadrats really difficult. But um, it's part of why that recovery of the CCA was so important in that area too, because it actually helped bind all of that coral rubble together so that baby corals could come in there, land and grow and help contribute to the recovery of the reef. So, one of the big things that came out of this data set was this kind of stark difference between the full reef and those other sites where we were seeing increasing cover and the longliner site where we were seeing the decreasing change in Um, And in addition to that, some of those sites, actually, let me, there we go. So you'll see that some of these sites, for example, RT10, which is that one that I showed you the video of, um, it's the filled in black triangles. Even though the crowl morph started to take off there a little bit, it got up to around 20%. You'll see that it really ended up decreasing there. And then at some of these other sites like FR3, which is a four reef site with really high coral cover, the crowl morph was never really able to take off the way that we saw it happen at the long liner site where it reached up to 100% cover in a lot of those photo quadrats. And so this kind of led to this question, of what drives the difference between the increase in corral morph at some sites and the decrease at other sites. And what was it about some of those sites that seemed to inhibit the growth of the corral morph and prevent it from exploding? And why did we see this huge explosion in the corral morph at other sites? So one of the questions that I asked was whether or not corral morph had a substrate preference. So if you had a juvenile corral morph, a little polyp floating along, did they preferentially land on some type of substrate versus another? And could that perhaps be tied into why some of these areas were more easily invaded than others? Um, and so I did a lot here that I'm not gonna go deeply into, but looking at the uh, substrate that was available in different areas, I calculated an expected amount of settlement for each one of these benthic substrates. And then this is the actual observed settlement. And you can see that crowl morphs actually extremely avoid settling on hard coral. And if you know anything about coral, that's actually not super surprising. Um, corals have a lot of different defense mechanisms. They have sweeper tentacles. Um, they actively compete with each other. If you ever look at videos of two corals competing with each other at night, it's crazy. Like they look like aliens wildly attacking each other. It's awesome. Um, and then we saw that compared to the coral where they actively avoided it, the coral morphs really, really liked CCA, that pink flat pavement, which makes sense. It's just essentially open space that's available for someone to settle on. They also um, settled on turf more than expected. The turf in Palmyra, because of that really, really high herbivore population, tends to be really, really short. Um, baby corals can settle on it. Baby coral morphs can settle on it. Not terribly surprising. Oops, I'm gonna trip over that. And then they also avoided um, settling on macroalgae. Uh, macroalgae also has a lot of defense mechanisms. Some macroalgae actually create allelopathic or chemical compounds that help inhibit predation. Um, and it makes sense. They also move. So it makes sense that the crowd morph would have a harder time landing on them. So then 
I wanted to think about, well, once they've actually landed and established themselves, we saw preferentially on turf or CCA, what did they do after they've landed? So this is kind of, I like to think of this as like, once they've gotten their foot in the door, what happens and how does that relate to the different benthic types? And we see here that the number of settlement events on coral is really low, on CCA is really high as we saw before. And then this uh, axis here, the number of transitions is remember we have those 100 points per photo that are kept consistent throughout time. So even as the photo changes, that point is on the same part of that photo. Does that make sense? And so if I have point number 50, and it was CCA in 2009, and then it was Coralomorph in 2010, I know that there is a transition from the Coralomorph actually growing into that area and replacing whatever benthic, um, whatever was there on the benthos before. And so this actually follows a relatively similar trend to what we saw for this observed versus expected settlement. Um, the Coralomorph had a harder time overgrowing hard coral. And then interestingly, uh, it overgrew macroalgae more than CCA, uh, that fleshy macroalgae, and then it overgrew turf the most easily. So in all of those uh, photo quadrats where we were able to see the coralomorph spreading across, across the photo throughout time, they primarily transitioned turf to coralomorph or macroalgae to coralomorph. Um, part of this here too is that this macroalgae includes some of the encrusting macroalgae like Pacinellia and other ones, if you know what those different ones are. So they're easier for the coral morph to grow on. The one thing that we saw the least number of transitions for were soft coral, which tend to be pretty well chemically defended as well. So to summarize that first chapter with a lot of information, um, I didn't touch on the photo mosaics and some of the other data that went into that for the sake of time and not boring everyone. Um, but although we found Rhodactus pauci at many sites, we saw a really drastic decrease at the epicenter of the invasion at that shipwreck site. This decrease was accompanied by recovery of the benthic community at that site as well. Um, it now has really high levels of CCA. And now this year, that data went up through 2017, we actually have a lot of corals recovering in that site as well. And we also found that Rhodactus pauci preferentially settles on CCA and turf algae. However, it demonstrates the ability to overgrow anything. So once it has that foot in the door, it can overgrow pretty much whatever is at that site. <coughs> and so this brings me to the other section of this talk. Um, and this is kind of a teaser for a paper that is coming out soon. Um, this is that project that I sort of brainstormed with my advisor way back in 2012. Um, where we decided to do this large scale removal and reef restoration experiment. So at that site, um, at the long liner site, we wanted to go in and conduct a large scale replicated coral morph removal and coral restoration experiment. And specifically wanted, we wanted to investigate the recovery and succession in plots over time following the coral morph removal and recovery and succession in plots over time following the coral morph removal and coral transplantation. To, and then we also wanted to determine whether coral spatial arrangement, when it was transplanted in, um, influenced the recovery of the reef. So just a reminder, in 2013, Fish and Wildlife pulled the longliner out of there. And this is an image I took. I couldn't even capture the whole scar from the shipwreck because it was so large. It was about 110 feet long. But this shows you this huge, now empty space where the wreck used to be. And the area around it um, is still essentially 100% coralomorph. And this is me hovering over one of my big, well, this one hasn't been cleared yet, but one of my big plots. Um, and you can see that this is primarily all coralomorph along the benthos with some kind of random big coral colonies that had managed to survive throughout time. But so we had the question here of if we removed that coralomorph and then transplanted it in corals, how would that influence the recovery of the reef? And so we came up with this experimental design of these plots are about 12 feet by 12 feet um, of having controls where we didn't manipulate the reef. So we just left all of the coral morph there, but monitored it throughout time. Areas where we removed all of the coral morph, but then just left the blank substrate alone to look at reinvasion rates of the coral morph into those plots. Um, and then areas where we did this removal and restoration. So where we either transplanted corals and CCA in randomly 
in species um, specific aggregates or in cross species aggregates. And in each one of these plots, um, for all of these, we also put in these things called cows, which are essentially two PVC plates together. They're called calcification accretion units, and it lets you measure the rates of calcification throughout time. But to do this, we needed to figure out how to get from this to this. Um, and if you've ever tried to do a lot of heavy lifting work underwater, um, clearing an area that's around 12 feet by 12 feet with a buffer space is not an easy thing to do. So in 2013, 14, I ran a dose experiment out on Palmyra with little tiny mini clearing plots that I set up to test the efficacy of citric acid, chlorine, and acetic acid in removing the coralomorphs. Um, Thierry Work and Greta Abbey helped pave the way for some of this with some removal plots that they did at a different site. Um, and they had found that chlorine worked really well. I was hoping to find something slightly less toxic than chlorine, since I would essentially be bathing in it um, for years of my life. And I was really hopeful citric acid actually did a better job than chlorine did. You can see the chlorine removal. There's still a lot of kind of dead and dying coralomorphs stuck to the rock. Um, but unfortunately, citri citric acid required about three times the volume of the chlorine. And <laughs> to get to Palmyra, you take a very, very, very small plane from Honolulu, and you are very weight limited. Um, and there was no way that I was going to be able to fly down enough citric acid to create these large plots. So we ended up going with chlorine um, as our removal mechanism. And I wish I had a video. We have like a time lapse video of watching me and my advisor and two other lab members install these guys. Um, but suffice it to say, this is about a 15 uh, foot tarp that we unrolled underwater and laid across the reef, weighed down, and then put chlorine underneath it. Um, and it was not easy to do. And it looks hilarious when you see the time lapse version. Like we'd have a big piece, like swell come through and the tarp would take off. And there's just like, I mean, it was like a comedy. Um, but we ended up getting this to work. We only did this around the shipwreck in areas that were 100% coral cover. And we did go in areas where there were a few small coral colonies. I mentioned how that area, the, it was very rubbly. So we were actually able to lift some of the small coral colonies that were in those areas out and move them out from the experiment. So we weren't really killing um, any coral putting these in. And this is, this is my advisor looking, modeling on the uh, removal thing. We put these in and you could actually see them reflecting sunlight and glowing from like, like they were like a beacon when you were driving out onto the reef terrace to find them. Um, and then I talked about bathing in all of the chlorine. This is when we first removed the tarp. This is the like silts and pieces of dissolving coral morph blowing up. And we had to wear these massive gloves because the coral morphs actually sting you and cause pretty severe allergic reactions. Um, so this was me being a crown mark ninja. Um, and this is the image of what they looked like. Some of them would completely dissolve. There were a lot left on the rocks that were kind of dead and dying. And we had the lovely experience of spending about 250 total hours one year underwater with our tiny dive knives, scraping crown morph off of rock to make sure that there were no crown morphs left in those clearing plots. Um, I will let you imagine how wonderful that was. Um, so here's the plot. They were about 10 feet by 10 feet in area with a buffer zone. We installed four eye bolts in each corner. We put uh, cow tags, like the ones you put in cattle ears, on each of these so that we could mark them throughout time. And then we had floats on these so that we could come back. Each one of these had three cows. And then the restoration plots, we transplanted in Acropora cuminata, a branching Acropora. Montipora capitata, Fossilopora damacornis, and Crestos coral and algae in those varying arrangements. And so this is kind of our, this was like you lived and died by this map underwater. Because um, remember, this is like a 110 foot long scar. And so you're going around to all of these sites, resurveying them every year and doing all of this. And so we had our controls with no removal, the removal controls random corals, aggregated corals by species, and aggregated corals across species. And so we installed all of these randomly across the site um, to track them throughout time. 
this is what those no removal ones look like. We just image them. This was before we had the really nice uh, imaging cameras. And so this was me hand stitching together a lot of photos. This is one of the removal controls where we took out all of the corral morph, but then didn't transplant anything in so that we could look at reinvasion rates of the corral morph. These are those cows I was talking about um, before. And then the uh, random transplantation of corals in there looks something like this. I used a random number generator and dropped in the different species in Custis coral and algae. Our aggregated corals by species looked like this in a plot. So with Poslopora, Montipora, um, Acropora, and CPA. And then we had these ones that were aggregated, but with all four species in each aggregation. Um, and this has been a lot of work. A lot of people have worked on it. Um, and the Austria student in our lab uh, worked up a lot of the data from this because it was still coming in uh, in 2018 and we're still collecting this data now as well. But to make a really long story short, we saw an almost complete decline in the corral morph cover in those plots, even in the ones that we didn't remove the corral morph from. So the ones that we didn't remove the corral morph from, most of those have like less than 2% corral morph cover as of 2018. Uh, we saw an increase in coral cover of over 392% across all of those photo quad or all of those clearing plots. We saw that turf and CCA came in and primarily dominated on all of that cleared um, benthic substrate. So rather than the corral morph just reinvading, even from the edges, we saw CCA and turf come in there. And then we also found that those aggregations of coral, rather than the random distribution, were the most successful. And it didn't matter if it was an aggregate by species or across species, those ones had the highest rates of survival and grew the most. Um, and this is all coming out in a paper that will be released shortly, but I wanted to give you guys an idea. This is one of the plots. This is 2015, and you can watch it throughout time. 2016, you can see these are all the big Acropora growing, some Poslopora, again in 2016, and by 2017, these Acropora were each one stick when we transplanted them in. So you can see that it was like here's one stick at the very beginning. Um, and this was even 2015. We didn't have a video from 2014. Um, and so these were incredibly successful and were a pretty, um, I have to admit, when I put these in, in 2014 with my advisor and some of my lab mates, we kind of thought we were crazy and wasting a few hundred hours underwater going in and doing this because the corral morph um, cover at that site was so extreme. It just seemed impossible that it wouldn't just reinvade and kill all these baby corals and take over. Um, and so this was really, really heartening and exciting to see and suggested that doing these large scale restoration experiments and tracking them long-term and throughout time, that you actually can make a difference in some of these areas on the reef. So to conclude and leave time for questions, um, Overall, my research found that Palmyra is a relatively intact ecosystem that has had the uh, unfortunate experience of having both local and global stressors occur there, but it's had a really uh, amazing ability to recover in all of those instances. We've seen a decline of the corral morph. I didn't touch on it today, but another big part of what I looked at was the response of the reef to the bleaching event. Um, Palmyra experienced bleaching, but we actually saw really high rates of recovery after the bleaching event. And a lot of this probably has to do with the fact that you don't have a lot of confounding um, impacts out there, right? No one lives there. There's no human population. There's no overfishing. There isn't fishing, period. Um, there's no point source pollution. Like it's a very minimally impacted area. And so when you have these stress events that come in there, um, the reef is able to recover and respond to them pretty well. And I had the fun experience of being out there during one of my trips, Sylvia Earle came out um, and stayed with us uh, with her video crew checking out Palmyra. And then right as I wrapped up my PhD, she actually named Palmyra as one of her new hope spots um, that she's highlighting because of what she saw out there, which was a pretty amazing experience. Um, also just really cool. She was diving with us out in gnarly conditions on the fore reef and was just a total badass. It was really cool to see. Um, so with that, just thanks to all of the people that helped with this. Uh, this was a massive amount of data over 
many, many years. Um, I worked in a variety of different fields and um, there were a lot of people that made this work possible. So with that, thanks you guys. Uh, this is my office view for my 10 years of graduate school at Scripps. This is not what my office view is now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for that riveting presentation. Um, and you'll see we do have this audience microphone. That's for our online audience. So they do appreciate it uh, when we use that for questions. Um, does anyone in the room have a question? Oh. That was longer than I meant it to be. I was like, oh God. That was a great, thank you so much, Amanda. That was amazing. Um, and uh, I just had a quick question. I think you might have maybe touched on this in the beginning. What was the depth of the sites that you were working at? Yeah. Um, and for the, especially for the uh, rec site as well. Yeah. Um, so the depth of those sites varies. The rec site is in about 20 feet of water, um, like 15 to 20, depending whether or not you're on top of a big coral colony. Um, the wreck actually popped out of the water at low tide and you could smell fuel. Like in 2013, you could smell fuel in the wreck and there was still fuel in it when they actually went in and removed it. Um, which also I'm sure contributed to the reef not doing well around it. It was actually slowly leaking out fuel. Um, a lot of those other sites, the four reef sites are all anywhere from 30 to about 60 feet. And the other reef terrace sites vary from RT10, that one that was really beautiful, has some parts of it that are like, like when I drive through that site, I have my engine clicked up and you're dodging coral bombies um, all the way down to like 25 feet in some areas. So there's a huge amount of rugosity at a lot of those sites. Okay, any other questions in the room? Okay. Um, so, in reference to that bleat, uh, the leaching, do you think that the corral morphs like liked that at all? Is that one, maybe one of the reasons they were doing so well when that wreck was in there? Or do you think it's just because of the physical disturbance? So asking if the fuel leaching has or something to do with that. Or metal leaching or... So, <laughs> so um, my master's research actually did a lot of work looking at that. Um, I looked at whether or not iron leaching out of the shipwreck was influencing the growth rates of the corral morph. Iron's actually another limiting factor on most low-lying atolls. There isn't a land-based, um, like it's not a, a long and big continent where you get all of the land-based sources of iron coming in. Um, and so I looked at that and I actually found pretty high levels of iron in both coral and corral morph all around the atoll when I did that. Um, and so one thing I didn't touch on a lot is that Palmyra was actually occupied during World War II. We occupied it. Um, as a station to use and to prevent anyone else from occupying it. Um, <clears throat> and when the US military did that, they dredged out some channels so that they could bring big ships in. They also installed um, metal sheeting in areas like around docks and that kind of stuff. And there was another old barge on the reef terrace um, a bit in from the Longliner wreck site that had been seen there. We actually called it Rust Island. It had palm trees on it, but it was an old barge that were sitting there. So there was actually a large amount of iron at that um, atoll before. And so we really thought that it was iron leaching from the wreck. And that didn't seem like as clear of a story as we had thought that it would be. Um, but one thing that was really interesting when I analyzed pieces of the shipwreck during my master's is I actually found that it was an old enough shipwreck that it was coated in what's called tributal tin, which is no longer legal to have on ships because it's an anti-fouling paint um, but it's actually really toxic to a lot of marine organisms. And so I think there were probably a lot of things that contributed. Fuel leaching out of it was not good for coral in the area. Mm -hmm. Tributal tin covering it wasn't great. Um, I also think just the massive disturbance of that grounding event was huge. Like there was a rubble swath from where it had like ground up onto the reef. Um, I also did a lot of genetics during my master's looking at whether or not this specific corral morph maybe was an invasive strain that wasn't native to the island before. And that population around Palmyra is actually highly clonal, suggesting that maybe it is a certain strain that has higher invasive abilities, but I didn't have another population to compare it to. Okay. Um, so All right. I think that it's, I don't think it's one clear cause yes. and effect story. All right. Okay. I have another question. Yeah. For the calcification things, that what is, what is that? Is that just a little... Thing in the water that you like can measure how high things get next to <laughs> uh, it or yeah so I didn't touch on the cow story at all 
Um, those are actually PVC tiles. They have a little bit of space in between them and we would go back every year and collect the tiles, dry them, weigh them, analyze what was on them and then you can get calcification measurements from that and then we'd install clean tiles. And so you can see, you know, we take some of those tiles out and you'll have like an inch of CCA on them because there's such high levels of calcification and accretion at those sites. Um, is that algae that's growing on it? The CCA? CCA? Is that pink, okay. The pink um, calcifier? Yeah. So it is an algae, but it's a calcifying one. Okay. Um, so that means that areas that have that really high CCA growth are highly calcifying, which is a good thing, versus you get other ones that are just covered in um, algae. We actually, at some of our sites, our cows get covered in Kralmarf. Okay. CCA. Cool. Last question. So you didn't have a human population or you didn't have people living out there, but there was a station that you guys stayed on. So you didn't have to come in and out every day. Yeah, or? There's a research station there that um, it's not open. Like it's okay. just for scientists that get to work out there. Um, and it's open, I want to say like eight months out of the year. Um, and teams of scientists can come in and work out there, but there's no permanent human population. And there was no like local native population there at any point in time. Yeah. I think Other, there was one more question. Oh. Well, yeah. Um, you just answered most of it, okay. and I guess uh, I'm from the DARP. Uh, While well, the NRDAR, or um, that's that's the DOI equivalent here at NOAA. Yeah. But it it seems like there could be another presentation based on what I was interested in in the relational effects of that wreck and the um i guess the chemical and physical environment and and how that affected or didn't affect your um your invasive um uh, i'm st stumbling on the name of it the Corralmorph, yeah, yeah Corralmorph. <laughs> sorry the thing i've never heard of before this presentation yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it's really interesting that you looked at that in, in your, your undergrad, I mean, your grad, your master's work prior to doing this PhD stuff. And, and it's, uh, I think, a different aspect of what's going on there that might be interesting to other coral studies going on elsewhere. And uh, not just with corral morphs, but those um, physical chemical interactions with yeah. the reef and, yeah. and how those because yeah, there's obviously the the impact from the rubble field and, and the impact uh, that, you know, just the grounding itself. But then there's the subsequent what's going to happen over time from exposure of other things that, mm -hmm. you know, TBT or whatever. So I, I really found that pretty interesting, even though it was a small part of today's presentation. Yeah, um, that was a, a lot of work and it was hard because it didn't have like a really, really clear story from it since I found such high levels everywhere. Um, so I, it's funny, I don't normally put that in presentations where I'm telling the longer story, but inevitably that's always a question that people ask. Um, so I feel like I should make a slide to have at the beginning of talks to touch on that. But it was definitely really, I also, um, the reef, I wish I had some better photos in this one of what it looked like when the shipwreck was still there. Um, but there was kind of a small area around the wreck, a little bit of a band where you didn't really see much growing there. Um, and interestingly, for the fact that it was 100% coralomorph cover around the shipwreck, there were no coralomorphs on the wreck itself. Um, there were some Poslopora that grew on the wreck because they're a coral that can grow anywhere, um, but there were no coralomorphs on the actual shipwreck. So I definitely think that there is a, some toxicity to the wreck itself probably from the tributal tin and fuel leaching out of it as well. <laughs> it's a Taiwanese long lining vessel, yeah. 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 So, and that was why I was interested to see if that strain of coral morph was an invasive one, like thinking maybe it came in on ballast water or on the ship hall itself. Um, and I think that there is a master student that's now interested in picking up where I kind of left off with that genetics work um, and comparing it to other populations. I actually didn't touch on this. I should have. Um, although this was a case study at Palmyra, this type of crowl morph is actually, there's similar blooms like this happening in other areas. Um, Ulithiatol in Micronesia is experiencing a really massive outbreak of crowl morph there, where they have areas that are 
um, Karl Marx cover now. Uh, we see this out at Helen Reef, which is uh, in Palau. Uh, they have this Karl Marx out there. Parts of the back reefs in Morea have this there now in some increasing numbers, um, not quite as extreme as what we saw in Palmyra, although the one in Micronesia is. Um, and I think that the Coral Reef Task Force that uh, NOAA is on along with DOI and a number of other agencies is interested in looking at the Micronesian outbreak soon. Okay, so I'll just check on our online questions. Okay. Perfect. The back reef is, yeah, so the back reef and the reef terrace are inside of the reef crest. Um, and so they are, in general, much more protected um, than out on the fore reef. So that's part of why they have these like huge, giant plating corals. Like we have plating a cropper out there that's like 35, 40 feet across um, because it's much more protected. Okay, so the first question uh, was, what was it about the presence of the boat that encouraged the coral morph invasion? I think you kind of uh, covered that probably since that yeah. question. Okay, so nothing more on that, but um, someone else wanted to say, wondering what happened at Bikini Atoll and other areas used for nuclear bomb testing, if there's been any studies on recovery. Um, I think that people have started looking at some of those reefs. Um, I think, is it at Bikini that they're finding that the dome they built might be leaking? Yeah, they found that there's been some, I guess we saw a bunch of episodes from a couple of recent like hydrographic surveys that found some pretty distinct changes in the reef structure and the growth there. Yeah. Um, kind of mix of everything in both good and bad. Concrete dome that we put over some of that, the, key, um, the Marshall Islands is the big one. The Marshall Islands is the one with the dome, yeah. That's, yeah, and it, that's the gentleman over here testing. That was the, that's leaking potentially and a few other things. Yeah. Um, so to summarize what that chat was about, mm -hmm. uh, at the Marshall Islands and Bikini Atoll where those domes were built, a lot of them are leaking and they're seeing varying responses of the reef in those areas, both good and bad. Um, I don't know how much you would necessarily have success with restoration efforts in those areas until some of those things were addressed. I also personally wouldn't really want to go dive in the water around leaking. In the Marshall Islands. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't know as much um, about those areas. Okay, um, and then our last uh, online point for right now is just uh, someone who said, just a comment, nice to see someone else who appreciates the uh, sunset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do miss this quite a bit. Actually, this is like a shameless scripts plug, but it is one of the best places for having everyone just like die hard appreciate the sunsets that we get there and appreciate like where school is. Because if you're working in the lab at sunset time, like everyone from the outer offices will come running into the labs to grab everyone. And like every night at sunset, you can see all the PIs and students lined up along balconies taking pictures of the good ones. So it's okay, a great cool. place. Okay, so um, last call for questions. Okay, so I think that's all we have for today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thanks everyone.